All right, we're back, people. Season seven premiere. We're in the final home stretch, the final 13 episodes. Pat, it's been a long road, but we finally made it. You got anything to say before we get started? Hey, listen, you know, I think the Talking TV family that's Talking Thrones with us here today will greet with me that Maisie Williams must have been ch talking Chinese food uh, in this episode, Shape of Dragonstone. And, uh, oh, wait, this is Ed Sheeran's in this episode. I just, I, just, I, I failed the joke, but, you know, he's in it. <laughs> They're talking about it Chinese worked. food. No, it, but, it worked either way. Because you know, whatever the, whatever the lyrics are of that song. <laughs> are you talking about the shape of you? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Uh, listen, it's been a minute since I listened to that song, but, uh, you know, uh, is, the, is my best attempt at an Ed Sheeran joke. This is your segment. It's already gone on too long. All this and more on tonight's episode of Talking Thrones. Man, of course we kick off the, one of the most problematic seasons with a with a poorly timed joke about Ed Sheeran. Oh man, welcome back. People. Listen, you just you just told me that this was a uh, you know birthday present for it's true. for it's true for Arya. Like I, I, I am so confused. Must be true. Yeah, hey, listen, I I, I did not uh, listen to the internet gossip, so uh, this is news to me. And uh, I'm flabbergasted if this is true. <laughs> You're so much better off. Welcome back, people. We're back with another season of Talking Thrones. Like I said, we're in the final home stretch here, the final 13 episodes. It's been an absolute blast recapping the show. All the fun, all the craziness that's happened along the way. Like I said, we finished the middle stretch, seasons four through six. So now we're on to the final stretch. And as some people would call arguably the most problematic stretch, the stretch that killed the show. I've got a very controversial opinion going into this, which is that I don't think that season seven is really that bad. The final six, like I said, we're saving that for consensus for when we get to that. But and for my money, at least, season seven was very, very entertaining, very, very enjoyable for a lot of reasons that I feel like a lot of people would probably not disagree with. I remember when this season came out, it was this is famously the only season that did not take place, that did not air, I should say, during the show's usual spring runtime. You know, the show would usually almost always premiere in either March or April, and then it would usually end around roughly May or June, depending on how many episodes, you know, depending on the, how the 10 episode um, sequence they would run. And famously, because of the much heightened production that went into the last two seasons, they chose to still release this season one year after the season six in 2017, but they pushed back the release date. This season did not air until, if I'm not mistaken, June of 2017. And so... And it, obviously, the, you know, the episode count was shorter. They famously said that it was going to be 13 episodes that they were going to do split up across two different batches. Ironically enough, similar to what they're doing with this new batch of better, with this new final season of Better Call Saul, of which the uh, mid-season premiere will be airing shortly after we're done recording this episode at the time. And so going into it, like I said, this was new ground because even though season six was pretty much past the books, we, we there were still like some kind of like leftover hanging loose threads from the books that we were still wrapping up and all that. But this was completely new ground. And, you know, uh, what's it called? Like I said, we pretty much wiped all the other ancillary characters off the board. Everything had pretty much been very streamlined. We were really back on focusing on our main characters. And everything was kind of all shaping together into one of the two storylines that we ended up seeing and pursuing through to the end of the show. That being, obviously, Daenerys' war that she begins waging with the Lannisters and Jon preparing the North for the eventual siege and attack by the White Walkers. And, Pat, I don't know what your thoughts are, but for my money, at least, just as far as this season as a whole, I had a blast with this season. I think it's very streamlined. I think the right it's not quite to the caliber of the first four seasons, but they almost bring it back to it. I think the action is much higher. I think the obviously the production speaks for itself. The production is much higher, but it's not just the fact that we get just like more dragons and explosions, you know, it's the fact that the pace just feels that much tighter, you know, much more quicker. You know, the sense of urgency is much so much more increased. You know, it feels like we're in a race against time from the first episode onward. You know, I don't know what are, what's really your thoughts on that? Listen, when we started this show, I went on a uh, crazy uh, binge of like the entire series. And I, I can't say, you know, I think I've been talking about it the whole entire time that the later seasons are more bingeable than the early seasons. And so when I got to season seven, I went through that like a hot knife through butter. And, you know, listen, it, it is a, um, you know, awesome season. It's kind of. You know, listen, it might not have been the 
perfect, like everything that you liked from the first four seasons uh, in this particular uh, package. But I think it was uh, just like you said, really action packed, really enjoyable. Like, I think they went out of their way to make it sort of like a bingeable season. Uh, you know, I, I was watching it week to week when I originally watched the show at the time. Uh, and I still enjoyed the, the series. But uh, like when I went back and binged it, um, season seven was even more appealing. Yeah, especially considering just, you know, kind of in the week to week basis with which we watched five and six and just how how much excess filler it felt like they put into those seasons in order to seemingly stretch it out into 10 episodes, how much they change from the books and, you know, for seemingly no reason almost. It just makes this season feel even, the fast pace of this season, I should say, feel even more refreshing. You know, also the fact that this is the only season that aired in the summer, it kind of felt like a summer blockbuster, especially as I, I still very much remember the summer of 2017 being a very lackluster summer movie-wise. And I was famously the summer that gave us the, still memefied to this day, Tom Cruise's The Mummy movie, you know, along with the Dwayne The Rock Johnson starring Baywatch film and a couple of other just gems of cinema. So this, so having this show during the summer felt even more refreshing. You know, it was really fun. I remember, my, you know, my job that I was working at the time, it was really fun um, working, uh, you know, watching this week to week. I feel like the biggest thing that season seven had going against it is because season six was, was really the first season of the show where it's like, okay, Twitter finally caught on. So there was so much attention and so much focus. And for the most part, season six was delivering on each episode on that week to week basis. The but I feel like Twitter was kind of a little bit unfair to this season when they watched it the first time. Don't get me wrong. This is not a perfect season. It has its fair share of flaws, for sure. But looking back at a lot of the criticisms, I feel like this is where I really started to understand just what it was like that film Twitter was going for, where I'm like, I feel like half the criticism they lobbied against this season could be lobbied against any other season of the show. Like, it just really didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, specifically the time hopping, the teleportation. They're like, oh, man, you know, they're like... It just always felt so – it was one of those things where it's like I feel like they're complaining about something that has a really easy explanation to it, which is they're just moving that much faster because there's less episodes. So naturally, you're going to be doing a lot more location hoppings in one episode than say you would in previous episodes. You know, hell, if anything, I feel like that's more refreshing this season than it was with the last two seasons, which just felt so dragged out and so stretched out, you know? Hey, listen, you know, it's – this season is, uh, you know, off to a good start here in episode one of this season. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those things where, like, they start us off with a kind of almost a repeat scene from the previous season. Right, yeah, right? you were so, talking about this on the finale of season six, and I wanted to get into your take yeah, get your take on that. It's bizarre. It's it's like Walter Frey, he's back and better than ever. Yeah. You know? and, it's kind of confusing and he, almost because you're almost like, wait a minute, did we just watch Arya kill this guy? Like, what's going on here? You know, but I. Uh, for, hey, listen, it gets me like every time. Like, I could watch the, you know, episode 10 and then all of a sudden, you know, turn episode 7 on a binge and I'm like, didn't he just die? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, it, it really gets me every time. But, uh, yeah. you know, listen. Really benefited it, from that year and a half gap and be, from that year and a couple months gap between the end of season 6 and beginning of season 7. You know, I think if you were watching week to week, like it was definitely, uh, you know, a little off putting because you you were probably like, wait a second, <laughs> you know, like uh, something's and, not right here. Exactly, and so you know, whatever. If if it probably didn't put the wool over everyone's eyes, but the fact is, you know, Walter Frey, he's back. He's invited his whole like you know uh, family, and he's you know talking about how cheap he is and like how you would never expect. You know, him to invite you to two I mean, I feel like that should have been a dead giveaway immediately. So, like, when is Walter Frey ever, like, admitting his faults to anyone? Like, that should have been a dead giveaway right there. Yeah, so it, it, essentially it's it's Arya going for the ultimate revenge, which is kind of wiping out your bloodline uh, and invites all these guys there to drink the wine and, and die. And, you know, she tries, she prevents Walter Frey's new young wife from drinking the wine to save her life and really to leave her as the messenger of, of this whole, like, uh, you know, thing that has gone on this assassination. So I think it was one of those things where, it, you know, it, it kind of doesn't quite make a lot of sense. It's, it's like, oh, hey, let's just kill off all the phrase and get them out of the, the storyline for good, right. um, you know, and make Arya look like a really awesome assassin, at, 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 you know, at, at that. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, completely unnecessary she could have you know nixed walter frey last season uh and then just moved on to winterfell and there was no real reason to like eliminate the phrase it's like without walter 
um, you you could kind of leave it up to your imagination that the rest of them would be lost. Right, exactly. I mean, they already proved last season that they were completely incompetent when they couldn't even take back Winter, when they couldn't even take back River Run without the help of the Lannisters. So that part, I mean, just shows exactly what it is. But like I said, it, it, sure, you could call it overkill, but I mean, it does end up eventually serve, serving a purpose because it once again kind of continues to kind of strip down Cersei and Jaime of their residual allies. But I mean, you want to oh, talk sure. about... It, it also uh, brings Ed Sheeran into the uh, yeah, fold, right? Because... Like... Once she kills, uh, you know, Walter Frey, like, uh, the reason why she stumbles across them on the road is because they're going to investigate that business. Yeah, Arya's usage rate in the first couple episodes of this season before she ultimately is told by Hot Pie in the next episode about, obviously, the Starks reclaiming Winterfell and her going home is interesting to, to say the least because the stuff in the following episode, Stormborn with Arya, I think is unbelievable like probably some of the best that Arya has been since the first couple seasons of the first couple seasons of the show before she went over and wasted all that time in bravos but i'll save that for next episode the bit but this scene i mean uh, like it would have been one thing if this sequence served a purpose for anything but the fact that like benioff and weiss only brought ed sheeran in just to just as a birthday present to Arya. And then not only does he not sing a song, like, you, you don't even get to actually hear a song. Like, he's hearing a song, like, as she's walking up, and then he just immediately stops. And then the rest of the scene is just sitting there. And then it's just these Lannister soldiers that are kind of, like, all complaining about, you know, how it's, you know, how they've, they've been away from their homes for so long because of war and how nobody really cares about them and all that stuff. Yeah, and they're I'm, the nicest Lannister soldiers in the yeah. army. <laughs> like, that's probably why they've been cast on this mission is, like, oh, they're too nice. Get them out of here. And I'm just like, <laughs> what purpose is this serving? Other than what, to show Arya, it's like, oh, not everybody that she hates on their side is bad. I have to assume that Arya's figured that out by this point, you know? Like, yeah, I, true. At least I hope she would have. True. And, and, you know, the only thing I can think of is, like, you know, maybe the Game of Thrones didn't really need Ed Sheeran, but, you know, uh, he could have really done wonders for that new Mutants movie. Maybe. Uh, yeah, you you're, know, still, you're still burned off by that new Mutants movie, huh? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Sneak him in there and his power is like generating pina coladas out of thin air. I don't know. No, they can literally like, do what they did the most recent Doctor Strange. Where remember where they were literally like you coming up with like different like musical tones and just throwing them at each other? Imagine if that was Ed Sheeran's mutant power and they did that. Yeah, he just he uh, the power of the staff, I guess. Right, cast uh, him as the male version of Dazzler. You know, like trust me, there's literally a mutant for everything. Like they can, listen, they, they, they the new the new mutants uh, might not have been my cup of tea. Um, you know, it's uh, they kind of didn't they try to bury this movie because it oh, was yeah. that bad. Oh yeah, well um, they tried to, but they realized oh, we we, we got to get this out eventually. Too many people know about this movie. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I, I hope that uh, Maisie Williams uh, you know, does some much cooler stuff than that. Uh, I know it's kind of like you know you're you're going into a Fox property, um, and you know it was kind of like a uh, uh, you know very independent niche story, and you know uh, could have been pretty cool for for your career, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. She could probably get better movies than that. Yeah, she probably could. I mean, she definitely proved that she's a talented actress. You know, and like I said, I, I think that this season mm -hmm. in particular is some of her best work on the whole show. But we'll save that for later on. We got a quick check in with Bran. Also, they got this really, really amazing sequence. That's the other thing too. The Arya killing the phrase is, a, is another cold open. Uh, again, we haven't gotten one of those for a premiere in a while. But I think one of the what for me one of one of the best. Like just from a tech again, they love putting those quick insert shots that are just a brief tech, like a, amazing display of technicals. Again, Miguel Sapochnik does not direct that episode this season. This is Jeremy Pedeswa directing, who directed a couple of the midpoint seasons in the last couple seasons. But I mean, he also directed the premiere, uh, the last season premiere of the Red Woman, which I thought was also a spectacular premiere. But man, that shot of just the cold frozen tundra and then the wind slowly rolling up and the army <laughs> of the dead marching, to, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it, it's no, so that, good. The vision is awesome. But then when Bran wakes then up when Bran at the gate, Bran arrives at the wall. You're like, uh, dude, dude, he's in full robot mode. It's like, yep, you this were at hard home, <laughs> like you ate shredded wheat for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like he's in full robot mode at this point. Uh, the way it's, that I call it is, uh, is like this is this is Bran's Doctor Manhattan phase, where again he's just so intertwined with the consciousnesses of literally every human being on the planet that ever was and everything. He's literally become a human computer. So I don't think he, I don't think his brain has the ability to process emotion anymore. You know, there's something, there's something to be said about like the higher cognitive abilities when it just gets to that level of like reasoning and logic that there just is no more room for emotion. But it's him and Mira at the wall. Uh, you get, oh, you get Dolores Ed and his quick appearance, his only appearance this season. And I, I just love it, too. It's like he asks, like, are you wild legs? And she's like, oh, you know, this is Brandon Stark. 
and he's like, I, and, and he's like, okay, how do I know that that's the truth? And then he just tells him like you were at hard home and you were at uh, the fist of the first man. Yeah. I'm like, okay, and, that doesn't say that doesn't prove anything. Like, it, yeah, he should have been like, <laughs> you, just you tell have him a, that you're John's brother. Like, he's just like you have a birthmark yeah, you know on that. your back shoulder. <laughs> like, he was just you know he's totally robotic uh, at this point. Like, Doctor Manhattan is a better way of looking at it because yeah. you know that's sort of I mean, a, an extreme indifference. The only, um, the only thing he can't do is dissolve particle matter because I feel like that would have solved all their problems real easily. Yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> this is a new side of Bran uh, <laughs> that I don't think anyone expected, and, you and know, I don't you, think anybody wanted either because for the most part, I feel like Bran was such a uh, not a compelling character, but such a, like a kind of um, you know, it was really engaging, like kind of seeing his evolution and you know his um, learning this sorcery, you know, and now that he's just like kind of this boring robot it's like yeah i I do i do like some of the quips right when he especially when he uh you know this is later on and and we'll eventually get to it in more detail but uh i believe he has a great interaction with jamie lannister um i do agree with that yes yeah and and there's a couple other ones as well like uh i think he probably has uh, some pretty good choice words to do with um you know little finger but uh you know so there's something about you know him being like all seeing and being able to uh, really, you know, uh, put out this wit and, and put these characters on their, uh, their heels. It's, it's like he has a sight beyond like what anyone could imagine someone else knows about them. Uh, and it, it's fun to play with that. Um, but yeah, in sequences like this, where it's just like, please let us in. We are, <laughs> you know, on your side. And oh, we're gonna be having so much fun with that over the next couple of episodes. Yeah, I can already I don't know. Know. listen, it, it's cool. I, I, you know, I make fun of the brain character at this point because, like, I expected so much more out of his storyline, right, than what I eventually got in the especially series. after how awesome it was um, in season six. Yeah, it's just. Th- it's it's like let's go. This is the magic. It's coming. Like Bran's gonna be our character, you know, that we've been through the whole series. That's gonna really explain to us and, and bring magic into this world, and just like it's gonna have a big impact. And essentially, he just ends up sitting in the grove. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it's he's the bait, and like he doesn't yeah. do much. Um, and you know, you, you just kind of wanted to see more of his powers over the right. course of season seven and season eight. Right. And the most that we get of it is him just possessing a flock of birds that just fly over. <laughs> and, and, and I love how too, after, even after he becomes this all knowing entity with the three eyed raven, he still does not learn his lesson as far as just like, again, keep away, you know, keep away. Don't fly super close. He just, he doesn't learn, you know, what, what can I say? So anyways, let's start to get to the big storylines of the season. So we'll start off with Winterfell. Uh, again, big thing here. Uh, John is now King of the North. And the whole thing that he said is he's doing exactly what it is. He said, he's finally the position of power. He's finally the position of prominence. So right his homeland and that he is he's just immediately instructing them on the on again what can kill white walkers he's like dragon glass uh fire he's like we got to start equipping every castle we got to start preparing you know we got to start getting everyone here to winterfell we got to start mounting yeah, up what, what is it man people. woman and child are gonna every be man trained? woman and child exactly like literally it doesn't matter it's like if they if, if they got a pulse and they can walk they're getting trained you know like they, like, like again it's like when well, you're yeah. get, well, you want to put this? a spear in my granddaughter's yeah, hand now, again this is the yeah. other season where like this they, they, they started to get a little bit obvious with the kind of you know insert like kind of woke messaging here you know i mean but i, I <laughs> well still think, i i think this they one handle it pretty well this, for the this one is now. really good like uh you know i know um I, I forget if it was last i think it was last episode uh the season finale season six um just where oh, like Adam Mormont was just calling out everyone. No, no, it's when Daenerys looks at Yara and kind of winks at the camera, and it's like, yeah. Oh, that all... was two of that was Battle of the Bastards, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it, it's like they're having their little meeting, and it's like, yeah, all the powerful women are in charge. Wink, right? Um, you know, that's that is just you're drawing so much attention to it. It kind of you know takes me out of the story right. because you know it's 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 pointing to um, you know something that's outside the story world. It's right. kind of you know, bringing you into a modern mindset, which, you know, Hey, listen, you know, I'm not going to disagree with the actual like message. Like, you know, Hey, if you're capable and you should be in power, then be in power. But, um, you know, I think this kind of taking you out of the story to draw attention to that fact, um, is a little harsh in terms of that scene. Uh, and here, you know, it's, it's literally, you know, to go based on your theory, it's, it's embedded in this idea that the, uh, army of the dead's coming and you need as many people as you can fighting um and so you know you can't really say that 
this is as clear cut of a, a message, you know, uh, as it was in the, the previous scene that we talked about. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say this is like, you know, everyone's equal type of, uh, you know, right. messaging. Um, you know, I, I think it's literally everyone, you know, in, in the face of death is equal. So therefore you better pick up a weapon and, and get fighting. Right, 2017 famously was the beginning of the Me Too movement, and I guess kind of the reason why I feel like that has garnered so much criticism for a lot of the art that it has affected in the recent years is because you end up getting these instances of like kind of these fantasy world and storytelling where it feels like they're going out of their way to kind of explain the message to the point where it's distracting you from the actual story world, or in some senses, you know, just kind of being the focus, you know, rather than the arc of the story itself. So I feel like that's kind of what a lot of people on the internet are trying to get are, are trying to get across well, and i feel like it can kind of get mixed it, yeah it, it would be different if they you know um uh, a real world event sort of led to a change in the storyline and they kind of leaned fully into it and you know th for the rest of the series you kind of have this um you know different storyline that was sort of inspired by you know a real life thing um but, you know, it, it's the cutesy kind of like wink at the camera and, and like then let's move on to the story we really want to tell. Um, you know, I think that's kind of where I'm at. You know, it, it's right. you're, you're kind of bringing it up but to what end just just to get, uh, you know, kudos that you, right. you brought it up. You know, is this a, a, a virtue signal um, <laughs> type right. of thing? You know, it's you're just showing that you support it, exactly. um, which ultimately, you know, listen, you know, it's like. Um, I just think, you know, when you're dealing with stories, um, you know, taking a break from the story to sort of like signal something else, it, it takes, you know, the viewer out of it or it can, it has the potential of taking the viewer out of it. And, you know, for me, um, you know, at least with that scene last season, uh, it was like, oh, wow, that's, that's yeah. really abrasive, like how they did that there. Uh, and they could have been a little more subtle. So, yeah. you know, listen, you know, our, our big escapism shows, um, should remain escapism to a yes. certain degree. And unless you kind of make a major plot line out of it, um, you know, like you don't need to sort of like stop the show to bring that up. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I think it's, a. Uh, Paul Schrader, you know, I, I was listening to a podcast and Paul Schrader was brought up oh, and, um, you know, essentially he says movies are, are sort of like uh, from the, the viewpoint of like bisexuality because uh, you're basically, no matter who you are, man, woman, whatever, you're looking at the screen and you're, you're sort of a voyeur into another world and you're sort of, you know, fantasizing about, you know, who these people are and, and what could be your role among it. Um, and so he says like the medium of film and television, uh, and I got all this from a podcast. So, you know, I didn't fact check this. So, you know, uh, jump. I on mean, it's internet. Paul Schrader. So but, I feel like that checks out considering, I mean, just, just look at some of his <laughs> Facebook posts because oh man, you want to talk about one yeah. of the most interesting creators alive right now. Yeah. But, uh, the fact is the whole premise of the idea is that, you know, movies should, uh, basically be ambiguous enough to get you the viewer to sort of. Uh, be able to get to that, uh, you know, f fantasy state because it is escapism. So yes. um, I think whenever you kind of uh, bring something up that kind of breaks that fantasy, um, it really doesn't work in film and television. I couldn't agree more. And th the biggest thing, too, I feel that is established by the arc here at Winterfell is the fact that, again, it's just it's more of Sansa undercutting John and it's slightly problematic because I now obviously with the benefit of the hindsight we know where it's leading where the whole thing is that Sansa is supposed to be using you know the thing the techniques that she's learned from Littlefinger to just distrust 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 until she eventually gains power to the point where again it's that it's that distrust of Daenerys when Jon goes and brings Daenerys up north that kind of inevitably leads to her becoming queen of the north and now we know that's not her intention obviously in the moment it's actually funny because Arya actually just called her out on it in the episode that I'm watching right now but it, it, it does kind of like certain serve a on purpose for again it's the it, she's john literally said to her in the last episode that they have to present a united front if they're going to survive winter and literally all she's doing is undercutting him at every single turn you know blatantly questioning his decision she does bring up legitimately good points about his decision regarding the umbers and the car starks but well, he even says I, I think you know one of the the greatest things about this is 
um, this particular scene. This was the Starbucks cup right on the table. No, nope, that's not until next season. Oh, really? It was that's not they're, until they're, next season. That's okay. the episode after the long night when that happens. Yeah, but it's the same table, right? You know, they're in the. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. Uh, whatever then. So, uh, you know, we, I, I, I'll withdraw my statement there, but, um, yeah, the fact is like, I love this scene when Sansa is questioning him because, uh, she's on him, you know, it's right. like, and she has supporters in the audience, you know, and it's, yeah. it's basically Royce like is with her little finger is with her. Like she's, she does have a decent amount of supporters there. Yeah. But then John basically says his piece, you know, and he, he draws the line in the sand and he says, no, this is not what I will do. I will not, you know, uh, have the sins of the father, uh, be bestowed onto, you know, the son. And I'm not going to take, you know, generations, uh, you know, like the ancestral home away because, you know, the father was the sinner. Um, you know, and, and it's like, it just, it really shows what type of leader and king he's going to be. And, you know, you kind of, even though Sansa brings up good points and, you know, there's probably people uh, in that audience that was, you know, in the court that were bringing up those same points. Uh, the fact that John stood up, he said what he had to say, he put that stuff to bed, you know, like right. no one at the end of that meeting was questioning why he didn't take those, uh, you know, castles away from, um, you know, the, the heirs to, to traitors, like they basically understood what he was trying to do and they respected him for it. And so, you know, in that post scene afterwards, when, you know, they're talking about the trust and, and what was that, you know, uh, Sansa gives him the ultimate compliment and says, you know, listen, you're really good at this. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, 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 like I said, it, it's if if I didn't have the benefit of hindsight now, I feel like I'd appreciate the scene more. But it, it still infuriates me kind of where they're going, especially since, you know, obviously how we know that like kind of John's character is kind of dragged down with how they dragged down Daenerys' character in the next season. But for right now, you're 100% right. It is so awesome to see where how after all this time, all these years of John finally building his way up, he's finally in a position of prominence. He's doing everything that he said he was going to do. He's not succumbing to the power. He's, he's still doing everything that he can in order to protect his people. He's, do, he's still doing everything right that he can. And Sansa's complimenting on him for it. You know, unfortunately, it shows that Littlefinger, Little Littlefinger is so all he does is he just has to be near someone in order for like his presence to like infect someone, you know? And it's funny because even the little figure is like such a non sequitur and such really like a non figure in the show anymore, literally to the point where I feel like this this season a kind of a one of one of the one of the things that I both like and dislike about the season is the fact that this season kind of just like slowly but surely just gets him out of the way. Is that like Littlefinger is literally kind of just devolved into like a mustache twirly villain at this point where he's so obviously evil and, and, and in a way that like he always kind of was, but not really, you know, he's kind of an interesting character. Now that they've kind of stripped away any sort of like, you know, intrigue and, and um you know, and morally gray area away from him. He's kind of just a mustache twirly villain. And it's like, he says it even said, it's like, yeah, literally the only reason why we have him is because he controls the fail. But I'm like, I feel like it wouldn't yeah, be that I, difficult I, to seize control of that from him, you know? I, I thought the, uh, this season's episode or uh, not this episode with uh, in this episode, the scene <laughs> with Littlefinger in it between him and Sansa uh, was really fantastic because, you know, they're chatting for a little bit. It's very brief. I, I don't even remember what they were chatting about, but Sansa stops him dead short. Like, don't even try to get the last right. line in this conversation. I'm pretty sure it was very witty. Good day, sir. And then he has to sort of eat his words and be like, my lady, and then Brienne shows up and he, and he says, my lady as well. And he walks off. He's finally uh, verbally defeated by Sansa in this particular scene. And it, you know, it, it's great. It shows that Sansa has grown, that she, uh, you know, fully understands Littlefinger, uh, that she's not really putting up with any of his BS. And, you know, Littlefinger has, you know, a, a little task, um, you know, uh, out for him, you know, in terms of like getting Sansa back under his control, so to speak. Right, exactly. And the biggest thing too is that Littlefinger, like, like I said, this this season is all about kind of like the Littlefinger's downfall, for lack of a better word, how kind of fine of all of his like finally, you know, mechanized, uh, you know, plot uh, tactics, for lack of a better word, finally backfire against him. It, it just kind of sucks that it still has to come at the hands of like you know some some magic deus ex machina in order for them to finally have an excuse to get rid of him. But I mean. Like, like I said, tomato, tomato here or there. We'll save that for later on in the episode. Let's cut to King's Landing. Uh, obviously, you know, this is 
a new Cersei Lannister. This is, for lack of a better word, boss bitch Cersei Lannister. She is all she is dressed all in black. She's got the short hair. She's got the crown. She literally, the first thing we see of her marching into a scene is her uh, marching over, you know, a picture of the throne room. Obviously, you know, back of the door, John and Sansa have much different, uh, you know, thought processes towards her. John is so focused on the on the Night King that he doesn't even think that Cersei's a problem. I mean, he is to some extent, right? The Lannister armies are not going to march all the way north, and Sansa's also like, don't underestimate her. She's going to find some way in order to get a leg up. And Cersei's arc this season is really, really fascinating, I think. Because on the one hand, it's so awesome to see her get even more validation by getting even more revenge against the people who have wronged her, obviously, as we see in the next couple of episodes. But also, this is kind of the beginning of her hubris arc, which is where she feels like she has achieved so much in the last couple of seasons that she thinks she's invincible, to the point where she doesn't realize that there is a conqueror coming with three fully grown dragons coming, you know? And so, it, it's, so like I said, we, we see Cersei in a really interesting spot. We also find Jamie in a really interesting spot as well, where Jamie comes in, and Jamie doesn't know how to feel about her. You know, we finally get, like, kind of the, verbali the verbalization of the look that he gave her in the last at the end of the last season when he saw her being crowned queen, where he's like, you just blew up the sept and kind of killed all your enemies in one stroke. Cause this is what we're doing now. We're just killing anybody that's our enemy. <laughs> well, you know, listen, listen, before he kind of confronts her about it, you know, just imagine the picture here. Uh, you, you're a painter and you're good at painting maps on uh, stone floors and your boss, the queen of the seven kingdoms is literally just watching you as you painstakingly recreate Westeros on the floor like what kind of stress was that painter <laughs> under like you know hey, mistaken, Jamie so comes in Jamie I can comes actually in add a little bit like, of context to that as well because that's actually the famously one of the production designers and he even said he's like yeah so they put him in the scene you know as the as the scene painter he's like yeah I was on my knees for hours on end and they <laughs> fell he's like I could you can even see him as he's getting up to walk out you can see him he's like struggling to get up there yeah, no, it, it was like that mural is like one of the coolest things it's of the so show. Awesome. It's just like Cersei with her newfound power looking down, you know, plotting what's going to happen in the upcoming season or two. Um, you know, it, it's just it's one of those things where you subtly get implanted in your mind like, you know, Cersei's got some plans like and it, within this scene, Jamie comes in and says, you know, the North, they hate us. You know, yeah. uh, the South, they hate us. We're surrounded by yeah, enemies. Like we're surrounded like, by enemies. Yeah. And, and so it's it's like there's nothing more chilling than seeing Cersei, you know, hovering over a map, plotting what she's going to do to top what she just right. did to the Tyrells. You're like, she's got some plans. We know that they're deadly. And, you know, she's now a, a trapped in the corner kitty cat, you know, and, and you know, it, it's like we know the whole stereotype about that. You know, it's like yep. y you're going to get bit. You know, It's kind of nuts because, oh. the, 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 again, the, the genius and I think the the underrated aspect of season seven is the fact that literally the, all the cards are in Daenerys's corner. Daenerys has got the Tyrells, the Greyjoys, the Martells. She's got Tyrion, obviously, advising her. She's got the Dothraki and the Unsullied and three fully grown dragons. There is literally nothing that she should that that should be against her. And it's somehow, somehow in the first three episodes, everything that Cersei does in order to kind of destroy, undermine her, cripple all of her allies at once, and kind of put her in a in a in a what's it called? Oh my god, what's the, I just totally blanked on the word there. Put her in 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 a in a landlock in a stalemate. And, and, and all how it actually, again, they're not jumping through logical hoops like they did in the last season. Everything that they do makes sense here, you know, because Cersei is literally using Daenerys' mercy of not wanting to destroy and raise King's Landing to the ground against her, you know, literally to the point where, again, it, it comes to a point where that's kind of only Daenerys' only option after a certain point. Like, it, it's kind of a genius how they pull that off, you know? Listen, Dom, I, I think your assessment that Daenerys has everything going her way is well, it completely, seems that way, I should it's say. completely wrong because Cersei has Ed Sheeran on her side. <laughs> He's in her army and, you know, it's just a matter of He's time before he gets bring to the, the dragons all into his corner. Yeah, he just needs to get to the front line, and then, you know, he could take out, what, two dragons by himself? Easily. Easily. I mean, that, I mean yeah. again, the, the two dragons are taken out by, like, some of the dumbest of plot conveniences as it is. Well, the one, not really. It's kind of cool. But the other one, uh, we'll get to that next season. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it results in, again, what, what JB kind of kindly reminds her is, like, look, the phrase were our only allies, and they're dead. We don't know who killed them. It doesn't really matter. We need allies. And Cersei's like, oh, don't worry. 
I got someone pulled out of the pocket. Who does she get? Literally the only other people that we get. You're on Greyjoy. And now we know. I'm like, oh, so this is oh, going to serve for the rest of the Dude, story. Dude, th- this scene was... Oh, it's so it's, great and it's so it's, terrible at the same time. Explain to me how they could just really... All of a sudden, the Greyjoys are like... You know, they're, they're just on their deathbed. That storyline means nothing to you anymore. And then all of a sudden they, they flip the switch and it's rocking on full cylinders. And you get a scene like this where he comes in and it's like, oh, I want a queen. And, and all the wordplay, you know, it's like, you know, you killed your brother, you're on. He's like, oh, it's so so fantastic you yeah, should try it, it sometime like, he's like, you should try it sometime like, I, like, this <laughs> you is know? the part where you're on oh, loses man. me as a character because like the, the actor Peel really? Iceback he... even talked about it well no because of the first season the last season like again he was very minimally used he was kind of you know being Loki introduced he was only in a couple episodes he served one purpose you know as far as killing Balon Greyjoy and then taking over the Iron Islands and he did it you know he came in he did his thing and then he was out for the rest of the season you know like that, that, that he was yeah. only in like two episodes that last season here again he's now a main player he's allied with Cersei and this actor oh my god like you want to talk about just <laughs> hamming it up on screen he is just foaming oh, at the I, mouth I, I, every I, I th- single scene he's on camera I don't know I, I think maybe he uh you know watched a little too much Pirates of the Caribbean I before so, he did this he's role but like a crazy but Jack, I, I, Captain Jack impression I I really love it I I, I think he's just like <laughs> Uh, you know, out of all the characters that are still in the show, he comes in, he's very, uh, charismatic, crazy is the best way I can put it. And, you know, he's, you know, he's in this throne room with Cersei, one of the deadliest characters of the show. And here he is cracking jokes. You know, he's kind of sizing up the mountain. The mountain doesn't really like scare him, but he knows he can't beat the mountain. Right. You know, so it's one of those things where like, you know, he's, he has this weird, uh, confidence that we haven't seen from right. the, uh, the iron isles at all. And it's like, you know what, this guy, uh, is crazy and, and he is in control of all these ships and he's going to be a wild card. And that's what they betrayed here in this scene in in this episode. Absolutely. And I'll and, say this as far as like carrying out on that portrayal and that setup, they do a fantastic job because Euron literally becomes the monkey, you know, what's it called? You know, the chink in the armor, the, you know, the fly in the ointment, the monkey in the wrench, if we're going to quote Die Hard here, because Euron kind of literally becomes the key as to why Daenerys' and, Ish- and, T- and Tyrion's plans don't work because he's the one that carries out the attack on Yara's fleet. He's the one who captures Yara and the Sand Stakes. He's the one who bombs the Unsullied fleet when they take, when they try to take Casterly Rock, you know, where the Lannisters are going out after high guard you know like he, he is literally kind of cersei's uh you know cersei's ace in the hole uh for lack of a better word so he becomes like a pretty valuable player at least for the at least for the rest of the season and the other thing that i think is so hilarious that is established by this scene is just his uh, jb's absolute hatred for this guy because Euron <laughs> is immediately just tri- all he wants is cersei you know, because he knows that Cersei is his key to get in the Iron Throne and by default control over the entire land. And he knows about her and Jamie. And he is, and of course he knows that Jamie hates him for what he, for, for him going after Cersei. And so he's just poking and prodding at Jamie whenever yeah, well, he it's, can. It's great. Doesn't he say at one point, he's like, I'm here for a queen. And guess what? I got two hands. I got two hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really bizarre. Like It's so great though. It's totally oh, out of place, but it works so well. And I love the scene too when he's like, um, when Jamie is trying to call him out, it's like, um, you know, I seem to recall you guys losing. And he's like, yeah, you know, we needed to lose. You know, you know, there were too many people. And he's like, I was killing your people. And he's like, ah, there were too many of them. You know, uh, it's like, get him out of the way. I'm like, this guy's nuts. You know, but yeah. It- well, yeah, exactly. It, it's it's one of those, uh, you know, maybe um, that's one of the more revealing parts of the scene is maybe he was traumatized by that so much to the fact that he, um, you know, has made peace with that moment and, and kind of turned right. it into uh, feel for his insanity. Um, you know, who knows? Like th- this character, uh, really just gets amped up in this scene, you know, to the next level. It's like, listen, it's, it's now or never, you're either going to, uh, be in season eight or you're not. Right. So you better, you better prove to us, uh, that you're worth us writing, uh, some, uh, 
uh, dialogue for Absolutely. you. Absolutely, and, and and for for sure he did. Like I said, he comes in and goes out like I like the cannon that he came in on because he's like, look, he's like, he's like, look, I understand you're not gonna trust me immediately. He's like, I'm, he's like, I need to prove it to you, and he's like, the best way to a queen's heart is with a gift. And so he goes out, and not quite sure what he's gonna do, but you immediately get the feel that he's like, oh, this guy, this guy is is gonna be trouble for a lot of people going. Yeah, forward. I won't return the king's landing until Empty I bring handed. a gift worthy of a queen. Yeah, and, and listen, boy, does he? Because um, what he does results in probably one of my favorite sequences in this entire season in a couple episodes once we get yeah, to there, obviously there's, there's only like two things that he could do and and one of them is bringing ed sheeran back to the throne <laughs> yeah that's just going to be a recurring joke throughout this whole stand-up set of an episode. I love it. So let's cut quickly. Uh, let's cut quickly back to back to um, back to the Riverland. It, it's so confusing because this is supposed to be the Riverland, but it, but there's just a bunch of snow in the area, so you have to assume that it's probably actually someplace in the north. But it's it's still in the Riverlands because of how this ties back to season four. But we check in briefly with the Hound. This is the only time that we see the Hound and the Brotherhood before. Obviously, we meet up with them when they reach the Wall later on in this season. Well, well do you think that's like kind of a continuity error, or is it just signifying I'm that? Not- it's closer sure. to the north I'm, 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 it could be either or honestly because obviously the whole thing that's meant to assume is that winter is coming but it's definitely confusing when aria obviously again you know the twins is a little bit further south it's it's closer to river run and uh and casterly rock obviously on the west side and we can assume that uh what's it called you know that little farm where they were back in season four is probably closer in the north probably closer to like the, it's probably somewhere like between the riverlands and the Erie. so it probably is a little bit further north so it's probably it's not too far to the realm of possibility it's just a little confusing when they're both technically take place in the riverlands you know where if, you know but it is pretty big but yeah you have this scene with the hound and thoros more banter back and forth more bickering it's more hilarity back and forth and this scene i think is just it's it's stunning to say the least. Like I like yeah, again, I, I, I don't know what I feel about this scene because uh obviously it's the throwback to the uh you know when Arya and him were traveling and he stole the silver from this family and this is the end result, right? You right. know, they uh, essentially were starving and the father decided to uh, you know, kill his daughter and then kill himself and you know that's that's how they, they ended their existence. Um, and so they need a place to stay. Winter is obviously here and they go inside and, um, you know, start the flames. And this is the whole, like, um, Hound starts like just interrogating. He's like, why you, you know, it's like, I, I've, you know, seen better men than you, you know, and like, they deserve better, you know, and I love and, how he like, literally makes fun, of, makes fun of Barrick by literally just calling him, yeah. you know, you're just dull. Exactly. And so Barrick is like, you know, do you think I know this? You know, it's like, um, blah, blah, blah. And they ask him to do the one thing that he never wants to do. And that's go near the fire. Um, you know, so like the hound ends up staring into that thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, he just becomes, uh, Bran esque, right? He's just like sort oh of. My God. So to my to my knowledge, like he this... he sees the the army of the dead in the flames, right? Yeah, so for me, at least, this scene accomplished a couple different things. Number one, it's to kind of provide the Hound closure. Again, continuing again with a little bit of his arc from the last season. You know, this pad, this quest for redemption that he's on. You know, trying to right some of the wrongs of the past. And this is, again, throwing a, a, a harsh reminder of some of the things that he did in the past. And this is kind of like him, in a small way, kind of getting to, rede- getting to um, redeem himself for it. Uh, number two, it's to kind of establish, again, more of like kind of, you know, him getting over some of his phobias, you know, again, like kind of, you know, just the fact that he is now kind of in bed with this one group, this one religion, that even though he is fighting against the army of the dead, you know, for tying this back into the prophecy of ice and fire, it's the fact that, you know, fire obviously is needed in order to overcome ice, but it's the fact that he does have this crippling fear of fire that goes all the way back to his origin. And three, it's to kind of subside some of his uh, superstitions previously, you know, where, again, previously he had no reason to believe in the army of the dead or anything like that, you know, when he's asked He's like, look, he even asks Barrick. He's like, you know, I've got all these goddamn questions and nobody's been giving me any answers. And Thoris is like, you know, we, we can't tell you the answers because we don't really know the answers themselves, but we can only show it to you, you know? And though, so that kind of is what it's establishing here where Barrett, where the Hound finally sees what he needs in order to kind of, you know, get some 
for lack of a better word, you know, some reasoning for why he's doing it. You know, he's probably he probably went with the Brotherhood in the first place because he really didn't have anything anywhere else to go, you know? So now he's like, you know, they kind of offered him, like, really, you know, a better option than, you know, just doing what it was that he was doing back in Season 4, which is just kind of, you know, wandering around the Riverlands just robbing random people. And he's like, okay, I could probably do that or I could go back north and, you know, continue to help people. But he still probably wasn't quite convinced because he's like, yeah, I remember what happened the last time I was with these guys. But this is kind of convinced him. It's like, look, at the end of the day, these guys, they are fighting the good fight and they are fighting you know uh you know to preserve the living especially once he finally sees the army of the dead and sees just how many of them there are you know we obviously we can assume what he sees because we know what it, what he's seeing there and it's also obviously again just there to prove to oh yeah um, we saw it at the beginning of the episode like so right. we have to assume that he's sort of seeing something similar to bran uh his vision that it showed to us at the uh, start of the episode right and like, like episode. i said for me it for me it works because again it's more of just again some closure on his redemption arc that he is going through oh yeah i also like the uh middle of the night he sneaks out to, yeah. to bury the, the that was really father good. daughter and uh obviously you know he gets a little bit of a helping hand um finishing the burial yeah, that was that was really good, especially since again, it's like it's good to know that it's like okay, these these two can still team up when it counts, you know, especially given that how how much they constantly argue with bigger. I love the I love the term when it's like um you know is like you know what I I'm not scared of bald people like you. I won't say what he says. It's like you know you yeah, think yeah, that yeah. weave is covering it up, and it's just oh, like that man bun or whatever. Oh, I think so he good. says that directly. The house uh, but, is so grouchy. It's hilarious. But I also think like this scene of him making right and burying the father daughter. Uh, you know, sort of uh, is a callback to the broken man, yes. um, you know, and, and sort of just like him redeeming himself. I, I think you're right. Like the having this scene of redemption here at the start of season seven uh, is really important for the hound because now, uh, you know, we listen, I, I think this is the perfect setup for him to fight the mountain somewhere in this season. Um, but you know, obviously they hold off until, right. until next to, to execute that. But, uh, why not, you know, you start the season so strong with the hound. Um, you have him stare into the fire. He knows what needs to get done. And, you know, you should have just worked it so that the two of them are on the battlefield at some point. Um, in my opinion, the whole falling apart staircase at the end of the, uh, last season yeah. was was not for me we'll get to that when we get to that so we have one more major storyline before we get to the end sequence which is of course the citadel and i feel like you should just title every section of the citadel in this entire season uh stubborn old men you know a little play on words <laughs> with the grumpy old men thing because man sam just cannot catch a freaking break first we start off with one of the most confusing montages I think I've ever seen. Like, I mean, I, I get what it's trying to say. I don't think it's, it's confusing. Bit, I, it's I a think little it's, bit too uh, literal, I think, where it's like, I, oh, I, get I, it? His life is shit. Like, really? We had no idea. Yeah, but, like, um, just, like, how aggressive that yeah. editing is and, and the sequence and just, like, what the, the stew looks like to the and This uh, is where you, you know, knew that, like, Game pots. of Thrones really got to a point where they were just feeling themselves. And it's like, yeah, we could do whatever we want here. Listen, it, it was a really well thought out and edited sequence. Uh, do I agree with you? It's kind of disturbing and, and kind of like gets me every time. It's like specifically when Sam goes, oh, especially like, when they're in the middle it, of the montage. Especially the way that they're cross cutting uh, between him scooping the buckets of poop out intercut with the food that he's eating. And it's like, you really can't tell the difference between the two. And I'm like, what is this trying to say here? Like. Yeah, it's it's saying that uh, you know life in the citadel is kind of a, a very humbling one. Yeah, <laughs> you to know? say the like, least. To say the like, least. Like, it's it's I don't know. It, it's it's very fascinating. It's again, I, I think I agree with you. I lean towards um, there's something immature about this uh, montage yeah. for sure. It's kind of you know it, it's toilet humor at the very least. Um, you know, and the main things that you get out of this sequence are you know at the end of it he's kind of walking by and obviously jorah mormount has found himself in one of the cells looking for help looking to be cured of the dragon scale right um so that's that's obviously right. one part of this sequence uh the other part is you know sam finally confronts one of uh, the maesters one of the maesters he, yeah jim broadbent too famously in yeah. the season of harry potter and many many other movies yeah the the, the for me it feels like the the, the Citadel. How much was the liver? Time. How much? How many? How many pounds was it? I don't, I don't, I don't even remember what he said. Uh, that 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 was too many episodes ago. I, but uh, I believe it's uh, 147. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, you know. 
Yeah, well, I mean, hey, you paid attention, and I did. Oh, man, so. trivia, man. Think fast, hot shot. I know, you, I know, I know. Go. Uh, I should be, normally. Like I said, if I hadn't binged this season, maybe I would have known that. But <laughs> the biggest the, but the biggest thing that's established here is that it's like, yeah, kind of the Citadel is kind of useless, for lack of a better word. That's the biggest thing that I feel like is established. But it's like, again, it's like well, you got this hive mind of all these, you know, great learned men, but all they kind of do is just sit there in their in, in their hovel and just kind of advise from afar for lack of a better word you know well, yeah, they, the whole point is that you know all these external events are happening but right like, and it's their job to just record them and that's really it yeah and and they'll they'll always be there there'll be a constant there, right. there's not a sense that that will be destroyed um you know and so um you know that's something that's hard for sam to take you know and and you know he, he's just really wants to get to the core of the issue, which is figuring out how he can stop the white walkers. And, you know, he goes ahead and he, uh, you know, uh, sneaks into the forbidden zone and grabs a couple books. And, you know, this is watching this part of the sequence was really just like him opening up a book and like, Yo, that's Dragonstone. They got the yeah, glass there. It, it's a couple, it, it's a couple yeah. of plot holes that open up between this episode and the next one where it's like, why are characters all of a sudden learning information that was already told to them previously and then acting like it's completely new? Where he's like, oh, there's a bunch of Dragonstone underneath. Uh, there's a bunch of Dragon Glass underneath Dragonstone. Stannis told me, but I didn't. I'm like, what, what, what possible reason would you have to not believe Stannis? Like... But Stannis was never a guy that really lied about that, you know? So that, yeah, that's just kind of one of those, like, <laughs> no doy. Well, moments, it, it, it's, it's basically setting up, you know, like the next episode um, when John finds out, oh my God, Daenerys took Dragonstone and there's dragon glass there. I got to go talk to her. Right, exactly. You and know, like so. I said, it, it's kind of a no doy moment, unfortunately. It doesn't accomplish much. And really, the only big thing that comes out of the sequence is obviously the kind of the jump scare of where he's going past all the grayscale patients showing, oh, so that's where Jorah is, you know? So Jorah, so that's going to set up, obviously, oh, for Jorah and Sam. Listen, that, 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 uh, very that effective jump scare, I will say that. 100%. That reveal. And his arm is now, like, completely coded in the grayscale, yeah, too. Like, it's like that. Spread. I think that's one of my favorite reveals between seasons, right? Because it's. Yeah. You know, Jorah goes out on his mission and then all of a sudden, like, he's in the worst possible shape possible. And, uh, you know, we skip the whole journey there. We don't have to worry about him fainting on the side of the road or getting mugged or any of that stuff. He's just literally, you know, already at the Citadel, already looking for the best help in the world. And guess what? They're just going to let him die in that cell. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's kind of heart disheartening and it's heartbreaking. And I think it sets up for like, honestly, kind of a really heartfelt and touching like kind of story. Like when Sam does heal Jorah from Grayscale, you know, and it kind of does, it gives Jorah a second lease on life and it allows Jorah to ultimately continue out his arc of, uh, you know, ultimately getting to die in service for to his for his queen, you know, for the woman that he loves. And I think it's, again, it's, yeah. it's one of the reasons why I think Jorah's arc is one of the few arcs that really, I think, goes through all the way uh, to the end of the show. And like, it, it's really it, it, well fulfilled. It, 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 it amazes me that, uh, you know, all you have to do is cut the dragon scale. Off. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like. Well, no, it, cut it off in like specific pieces and then apply a medicinal ointment. It's like, wait, you mean to tell me that nobody thought to do that before? Yeah. It, it's uh, like, you know, Shireen had the best macers in the world and, and right. survived. You know, this thing undercuts is, the Citadel a little bit. No, yeah, you know, hive mind of high learning and, and knowledge. This and whole stuff. thing is hyped up, you know, like deadliest disease and. Like it, it's very rare right. that someone knows how to cure this, and went out know, of their way when they were traveling through Valyria two seasons ago, and they got attacked by the Stone Men. Yeah, it's like all, all you have to do is pop a daily vitamin, and you'll be cured. You know, it's it's, it's well, almost I mean, West like Coast that exactly that, so. Yeah, no, but the, the other big yeah. thing too, also that the sequence establishes as well is besides the constant is uh the Archmaester, the Jim Broadband character, telling Sam that throughout all of that he's like, yeah, it's not that I don't believe you as far as that goes, you know, but it's the fact that. Uh, again, we we have a duty to the entire realm, uh, to the entire realm, and the wall has stood throughout it all, you know, and there have been, this is not the only moment in history where everyone has thought that the world was going to end, you know, he announces off all these different areas throughout history, and again, it wouldn't be including the original time of the first long night, you know, which he also believes because again, that's written down in history, you know, it's like the wall has stood through it all. And the, and again, the wall has consistently kept them out, you know, and it will continue to. So it's like, I can't exactly say that they're wrong. I can't exactly blame them for their stance, you know, but again, I feel like it's one of those things where it's still just a little flimsy at this late in the game to have them doubting, you know, especially since we know where the resolution of where this arc goes ultimately, but it ends in, I think one of the most 
gangster ending shots, ending sequences of the last episode where it cuts directly from the Jorah hand jump scare to Daenerys after six seasons and six years finally arriving home. And again, it, it, one, of, one of my favorite sequences of the entire show, completely wordless, blaring the, the dragon theme song as the three dragons arrive oh, back okay. on Dragonstone. So, so, <laughs> you, you like this sequence? I despite, do. I know. I, I figured this is going to be one of those many sequences that we disagreed on. I love this sequence from top to bottom. It's amazing. When they land, when she puts her hand in the dirt, when they open the gates and they're marching up, the music's blaring, they walk into the castle, they tear down the the, the what's it called the Stannis flag it kind of a little bit convenient that Stannis didn't leave any garrisons there how he like okay. completely abandoned the so, castle when he so went to Stannis the wall. abandons the whole thing and no one thought to sail a ship up there and just take yeah. it yeah before kind of, Daenerys again, gets that, there that's a plot line from the book that they just completely dropped out because in the book famously that's how Cersei gets Loras Tyrell out of the way she has Loras take a garrison to take over to uh, you know conquer the castle for which Stannis has left the garrison there, and they and the, and the battle is so bloody that Loras is basically on his deathbed. You know. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's one of those things where uh, that gets to me that it's a completely empty castle. I yeah. I understand that Stannis uh, was low on men. He took everybody right. with him, and uh, but also must... it's probably the fact that Stannis probably didn't see it as really like holding a tactical advantage. He probably saw it as like, yeah, I've yeah. lost. To, to King's Landing. Who knows when they could sail for us? You know. Yeah, he must have. You know, obviously he abandoned it, but. I don't know. It just it seems kind of weird. You know, she just waltzes in, right? Takes it back, uh, no struggle. It's played for um, emotion more so than actual like conflict. I feel so. That's I, another. I, yeah, thing. I, I personally would have. I, I personally would have felt better if like, you know, she arrives and like, you know, the people there are sort of tired of the Lord of Light and they're like, you know what? Right. right. Let's let's bow down to her. Like they, there they, somebody there, like a mace or something, you know? Yeah, something. You know, I, I would have enjoyed that a little bit more. I, I think there's just flaws in this scene because, you know, obviously she gets there, she's putting the sand in her hand, signifying that this is, you know, she's finally returned home and this is her land. Um, you know, uh, Dragonstone itself has some cool set pieces, you know, um, uh, the long and rindy path up to the castle. Yeah, and, I really like the look of Dragonstone. Look, I was again just showing off that budget that they have. Oh my god! I'm yeah, like that is like, not the same Dragonstone from seasons two and three. Stannis's throne room. It's all yeah. awesome. Also, we, um, we 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 never saw the throne room either with, with Stannis. You know, we never saw. We only yeah. ever saw him standing in that in that meeting room, looking over that long table. And and then you know, obviously. Uh, you know, she gets to the room and, and she turns around and kind of looks towards Tyrion slash the camera and says, shall, shall we begin? begin? Only sentence um, uttered in that entire second that it cuts the black gangster. Yeah. So I, I think that I, I love that kind of line. I, I love how it sets it up as like, you know, now the real show has begun. And I, I think that's a really powerful moment. Um, I just kind of, you know, ultimately, I wish there was a, a little more to her arrival, like, you know, they don't, there didn't need to be opposition. There could have literally just been like, you know, this majestic foreign queen comes up and, um, you know, basically Stannis has been unstable for a long time. And so they just like let down their weapons, you know, they, they see the dragons and they're just like, yeah, we can't fight this. Um, like that would have been cool. Uh, I, I think certain things like maybe having, um, some sort of scene earlier on in the uh, in, in the episode with Daenerys might have been cool. Um, you know, it, not necessary, but it might have just like uh, I feel like it was very short and sweet and say, let's begin. And, you know, there was no build up towards that, like really powerful moment. You know, what if she's like on the ships and, you know, uh, doubting herself and then, you know, finally she gets there and she's like, let's begin. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's it's like she finally has gotten over, you know, some of her doubts. You know, right? Like I, I said, I'm just, I'm all, just all thinking the doubts from the last couple seasons are gone, and she is just here, and she is ready to throw yeah, shit I, down. I'm thinking a uh, novel esque, you know, sort of getting more into the mind of the character, right? And I understand that that's not necessarily needed in a TV show, but uh, oh man, it would I, I so want it. Yeah, you know, and because I, I no, really I think get it. Trust me, I get it. Amped that line up even more. I get it. I really, really do. But yeah, so with that being said, people, like I said, it's a great intro episode. It's great. It's a great episode. For, again, a, cu a couple of stupid moments here. But like I said, we're used to that now. Like I said, the, the pace is on. The race is on towards the final episode. Twelve episodes left 
It's going to be good. Make sure you guys keep sticking around. We're almost done. Like I said, we promised we were going to get there, and we are almost there. Pat, where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? Hey, listen, uh, I'm on Instagram, at Patrick W. Huber, and you can find me there. I'm posting things every day. And I'm going to go ahead and, and say right now, like, uh, instead of cutting you off later at the uh, outro of the show, uh, just go ahead and cast more Ed Sheeran in your properties. <laughs> more Ed Sheeran. That's the moral of this episode. And of course, you can follow me at Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms. And sure, will follow the official Talk and TV podcast across all social media platforms. Subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitch. Keep tuning into new episodes that are uploaded every single Friday on Talk and Thrones on Spotify and Apple Podcasts for the 12 episodes left that we have of this show. It's been fantastic doing this. And as always, people, 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you.